This is Tyler, your antisocial critic and the host of the Antisocial Network, your number one source for anachronistic conversations online. Come join us each week to hear opinions from some of the best voices discussing entertainment, politics, religion, and modern life on the internet today. Most of which you've never heard of, but I have. This week on Antisocial Entertainment, we're joined by uh, Matthew Gear. He teaches at the University of Edinburgh. He is the author of uh, At the End of the Street, In the Shadow, which is a book on Orson Welles. And he's currently teaching two online courses, one the other, uh, specifically on Orson Welles and the other one on American cinema in the 1970s. How's it been? We've spent a couple of weeks since we've talked. It's good. Thanks for joining for for asking me to join, uh, Tyler. Yeah, no, we've, I'm having a one week off uh, my online classes, so... It's been nice to get a bit of a breath, but uh, we've been having a lot of fun. Yeah. How's the? Are you doing both at the moment, or just the American cinema at the moment? I'm doing both simultaneously. I mean, I, I, I you were in my first uh, incarnation of the Wells course, and so yes. now I'm repeating it, and uh, with a slightly smaller group. But I, I, the new course is the New Hollywood, so I sort of do them simultaneously. Um, it's. Uh, it's fun. I mean, the Wells, I guess I've already written the Wells lectures and prepared the classes. So there's less preparation time now, this time around with the Wells class. And, but no, it's good, actually. Everybody, I've, I've really enjoyed meeting all these Wells fans from all over the world. We have in the new, the new Wells class, we have uh, people from Brazil, the US, uh, from uh, the UK, from Albania. So it's 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 like with, when we did it with uh, the first time it was you know very much around the world with orson wells so it's great are you doing this in addition to all your stuff at, at uh, edinburgh at the moment or is this just yeah yeah well i teach i teach in the in a course called um, contemporary cinema at the you know well it's at the edinburgh college of art which is part of uh, the university of edinburgh so it's all yeah it's been really busy and, and it's all teaching from home I'm in Scotland, so uh, we're still in lockdown. So it's been it's been a long <laughs> lockdown, but we're you know I've actually been really busy, so it's uh, it's good. Well, I recall when you do the classes, it's it went it, it was late afternoon for us, but it was like what midnight for you when you talked, or yeah. Well, that's that's part of the. I would say it's too much of a challenge because I'm a bit of a night owl, but I, I decided. When I wanted to make this sort of international uh, course, you know, anybody could join, uh, I realized I had to do separate sessions for different time zones. So there's sort of a session designed for the Americas, which you're in. Um, so when I do that, it's like Sunday, really late Sunday evening in the UK, but it's, you know, afternoon in the US. And I've got another session, which is for sort of European time zones or could be African time zones, I guess. Um, and that one, is mon it's monday night so it's actually it's not too different i mean it's like an hour ahead in continental europe from the uk so yeah i don't mind staying up quite late to do it but it's it's funny i mean what's what's impressed me is actually how despite the fact that we have people in all these different time zones because what actually happens is some of the people in the u.s wind up joining the class that i designed for the european time zones because that just suits them better because it's quite early in the afternoon in the U.S., so they wind up. Uh, we get this really mixed group of people from all, di all different countries, and I'm amazed how everybody just turns up on the dot uh, wherever they happen to be. And I guess this is just one of the new phenomenon of uh, the COVID era, where everybody's so used to, to doing these online meetings. Uh, yeah, you just turn up exactly on the dot, uh, so it's quite quite cool, and everybody just flies in from all these different places. Yeah. It is funny how just the mo the moment you hit seven o'clock, just everyone just shows up all of a sudden. It's mm -hmm. people are getting well trained. So, well, I, I don't think we ever talked about your specific background on Wells. I you remember when when before the class started, you had you kind of called me to kind of get uh, up to speed on what I was doing. But how did you get involved in Wells research? Because yeah, it seems like it's kind of a, a big. It's, a, it's not not a crowded field, but definitely a a, a very extensive one with a lot of research behind it yeah i mean wells did so much in his lifetime he you know he left uh, and he left so much behind that i don't even think with all the you know the army of researchers that are out there we can even possibly exhaust what he's left behind anytime soon but i got involved in wells uh when i was doing my phd in australia i'm from australia 
And uh, a chapter of my thesis was on Touch of Evil. And I'd always sort of been a big Wells fan since I saw his films uh, in the when I was a teenager. Um, and I just kept exploring his work more and more. I was very fascinated by all the unfinished movies and you get glimpses of those in various documentaries. And in a way, that guy just was fascinated by this career that, you know, was still such a mystery. Um, and then when I, I, I decided I'd do a, a book on Wells, and uh, so I, w I went to the major archives uh, where they hold his papers. So firstly, in the I, I first archive I went to was the uh, Munich Film Museum, um, which has, they didn't have really the paper documents. They they acquired a lot of Wells' unfinished film material, so the actual celluloid. Uh, Oya Koda, uh, I guess, uh, sold them to Munich in the 90s, and they, you know, for a while were involved with you know, pres preserving the materials, a lot of unfinished fragmentary works, for, and, and creating kind of presentation versions of that material to show at festivals and, um, and uh, you know, in various other... Uh, you know, limited engagements because these these materials are not widely available even today. So I saw the Munich material; uh, they were very friendly and let me have a look at all of what they were doing. Then I went to the U.S. Uh, I, I went to work at the uh, University of Michigan, who has they have a lot of Wells later papers, and then also the Lilly Library at uh, Indiana University, uh, which has uh, a lot of Wells early papers. Um, and that was really the research I background for my book on Wells. So I sort of, I was living in, in Buenos Aires for a while. So I actually took the material down there and uh, yeah, and I wrote the book down there. Not that Buenos Aires necessarily has anything to do with Orson Wells, but it's not a bad way to do it. Uh, but since then, I've sort of not been able to give Wells up, even though I've been researching other projects and writing other books. I keep coming back to Orson's uh, unfinished, particularly his un unmade screenplays. Um, I went to another archive, which really only we only really became aware of in the last couple of years, which is in Turin in Italy, the National Film Museum there. And they have another huge archive of papers, documents, and uh, it's a real jigsaw puzzle, actually, at times, because, you know, sometimes half of one document's in Michigan and the other half is in Turin. And, you know, it's three or four years later, I'm like, oh, yeah, page, <laughs> page two to 36 is in Michigan and pages one and 37 to 90 are in Turin. So um, it's, a, it's a fun adventure. But, uh, yeah, so I keep, I, I particularly am doing a lot of research into the unmade screenplays and, and all, particularly the later years of his life. In the 70s, he wrote many screenplays that he never filmed. And I'm fascinated by how these projects, even though they're not realized really beyond the page, they how they fit into his his body of work and, and what he was exploring. So, yeah, are you lots gonna, of archival work. Are you going to do that, uh, build that into something specific, or is that just for your own personal fascination? Well, I mean, the, after the book, I've been just publishing research articles. So I've had... Um, uh, the la latest thing that's come out was an article in the Hemingway Review, the latest issue of the Hemingway Review, and that's a study of Wells projects, um, all of them unfinished, and I'm including the other side of the wind in that category, uh, that in some way engage with the legacy of Ernest Hemingway. So there's the other side of the wind. There's also a, a screenplay, really a treatment for a, for a film uh, called Crazy Weather, which he wrote in the 70s, and that's all about... Uh, it's about Americans in Spain in the, the 70s and kind of, the, I guess, the antiquated nature of the Hemingway Macho Code and how that was playing out in uh, tourism in Spain in the 70s. And uh, so I looked at that. And I also looked at an early idea or sort of incarnation of what eventually became the other side of the wind idea, which was the Sacred Beasts. And there's a documentary where, well, where Wells is talking about his idea for a film, it's by the Maisels brothers called Orson Welles in Spain. So I was sort of looking at these different projects Welles was working on in the 60s and 70s where Hemingway and Hemingway's legacy was a concern. So, yeah, that's the latest article. What I haven't had the chance to read your book yet specifically. What is uh, mm -hmm. What did you address in that? Well, that is a study of his filmography, and I take a pretty... 
I guess, expansive view of what a, what Wells's filmography is. But um, the the guiding, I guess, focus of the book is how Wells uh, filmed cities. Uh, he created cities on screen uh, because I thought. Yeah, that's a slightly different way to look at his work. I mean, there's been some very good studies, you know, of his filmography, and there's also a lot of specific studies of individual films and biographies and so on. I mean, there's lots of books about Wells, as you know. Uh, but this particular study was sort of shaped around the idea that Wells was, he made films in cities all around the world. He also created cities in the studio. Uh, sometimes he created cities on film by taking a shot from one city and a shot from another city and sticking them together and kind of creating this um, new space. So, yeah, I mean, and because for the most part, all of Wells' films, not with too many exceptions, are set in cities, uh, it did mean that I could cover really the entirety of his of his body of work. So, you know, I'm, I, I was very fascinated by, well, not just how Wells films cities, but how film generally represents and creates cities on screen. Did you cover other directors besides Wells or just specifically him? In the book? Yeah. Um, no, the book is focused on Wells. It's, um, I mean, I would obviously bring in other filmmakers if it was relevant, but no, it's, it's focused just on Wells. So, but my other research has extended to the work of other urban filmmakers. I looked at, I've looked a lot at film noir. I'm very fascinated by film noir. Did you write something specifically on that? I, I know you've written more than one book, but that's I, I'm mostly familiar with the Wells book, so. Well, my second book, the uh, most recent book, is uh, about uh, a, a neo-noir by Arthur Penn called uh, Night Moves, uh, a Gene Hackman film from the 70s. And that's, a, that's actually more of a making of book, although I do kind of critically engage with the film as well. So, yeah, that's kind of a lesser-known 70s neo-noir, but one I think people should pay more attention to. Okay. So, obviously, before we uh, did the head, before you came on, we talked about specifically what I wanted to talk about, and that was, uh, and the re- and, I mean, the, in the last couple of months, we got the release of uh, The Other Side of Gary Graver, which mm-hmm. is a fascinating cultural relic that I think both of us kind of jumped on the moment we heard about it, because it's, it's an, it seemed like a nice opportunity to honor the late filmmaker, and I was in, we both kind of went back and forth a little bit about what our initial thoughts on it, but could you kind of uh, talk about what your thoughts are on on that? I mean, I'm kind, I'm kind of, I'm, I'm trying to, I'm trying to be nice to it, but I, at the same time, I'm like, <laughs> Well, uh, look, I mean, so the other side of Gary Graver is a Blu-ray, and it has four or five films, really, I guess, I think, features. Is that right? Four or five? Um, it's four, I think. W- yeah, there's a hidden uh, film uh, on the disc. I don't know if you found that. It's like an Easter egg. No, I did not. It's an extra feature. Um, it's the one that Gary Graver called The Boys and was released and retitled uh, Texas Lightning. And, you know, I really appreciate uh, the effort that has gone into putting this together by the, the it's gold ninja, I think is the name of the company that put it together. And, you know, it was very enthusiastic, uh, approach. I mean, I do have reservations about, I mean, the, 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 I mean, uh, the, the main problem with this Blu-ray is that the quality of the transfers that they present are really low fi and really <laughs> low definition. I mean, and that's a disappointing thing. I mean, one of the, I'll, I'll be up front. The reason I ran out and or <laughs> ran online and bought this was because uh, one of the films included on this set is filming the trial. And filming the trial, uh, as you know, was it's an Orson Welles project that was never finished. And the only sort of relic of this project that we've seen is a Q and A session Welles did after a screening of the trial in 1981 but you know i love any opportunity to see wells talk to be interviewed uh, in conversation and this is a really great hour and 20 minutes i guess uh q a session um and what actually happened was so wells had this uh, he had this tendency in his later years to make essay films and he made a film called filming othello as you know and filming othello is a sort of essay on his earlier film of othello 
Um, and it does a similar thing. Part of that film is a Q&A session with Wells in front of an audience who's just watched his film of Othello. So I think he was planning, or at least had the idea, of maybe this could be a, an essay on trial as well. But he only ever got so far as filming the Q&A, as far as, as, far as we know. Um, the Munich Film Museum has the materials, the, the actual, as far as I know, they have the negative of this Q&A session. Clips from that session appeared in the 95 documentary One Man Band. Um, and if you watch that, that's on the FFA Criterion Blu-ray. You can see, oh, it exists in really good resolution. I mean, if, if you see the Blu-ray, it's, well, these clips from that uh, Q&A session for the trial look great. So it does exist in really good quality. Um, I don't know exactly... <laughs> what the process of putting this Blu-ray together was, but the copy of this Q&A session on the Blu-ray is, I mean, as far as I can see, it's no better than the, ver the kind of bootleg style version that's been on YouTube and archive.org for years. So, uh, you know, it has this idea that this is in the public domain and I've never been entirely convinced why it should be in the public domain, why it's not I mean, I don't know who owns it. I won't even speculate on that. But I guess the disappointment for me uh, on this Blu-ray was that the, you know, I was expecting, I mean, first of all, it's a Blu-ray. I don't quite even understand why this material is on Blu-ray since the resolution is so low, why they just didn't put it out on the DVD. And unfortunately, it's true for all of the Gary Graver films on this um, set. Um, none of them are in anything really higher than bootleg quality and, which I think is a great shame because it would be really fascinating because, I mean, I'm not a huge fan of Gary Graver as a director, although it's kind of an interesting, uh, it is a relic, a pop culture relic, uh, but I, um, I really wish that we could see one of his films in decent resolution to maybe judge it a little better because when you're looking at, at these really murky transfers, you know, it's, it's, it does kind of make it a bit difficult to assess exactly, you know, are these films even worth watching? So, but I'm interested in your thoughts as well. Well, the weird thing about the Embracers, like the, the one that, that was kind of one of the ones they sold that box set on, is apparently they, they, they bragged that they got a hold of uh, Sean Graver and he just sent mm -hmm. them a file. So apparently that is the best version of that film available, which... That is a shocking and weird thought if that's the case, because I guess, I guess that means that at some point Graver's kids transferred some of the videos, but they just did it onto just digitized standard definition, and they just never did anything more excessive than that. But well, surely the, there are prints of these films somewhere. Um, I, I would assume they have all the reels in their garage or something. Like Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's that's the thing. I mean, I, I, I get... Basically, the company, you know, I, I guess well, yeah. their modus operandi is to take public domain titles, um, which may not exist in very good transfers, and we're used to seeing as sort of budget releases all over the place. Uh, but instead of just putting them out in, you know, very like bare bones form, they actually put commentaries and introductions and that sort of stuff, interviews and so on. Um, so that's kind of a great idea, but. Uh, yeah, definitely it's a sticking point because you have to sort of watch these films in very, very kind of low resolution copies, which, you know, in the era of Blu-ray, uh, you know, well, we're, I guess we haven't passed the era of Blu-ray, aren't we? Um, I guess we're kind of, we expect something better. And I, I, I thought that was a great opportunity to find some actual decent prints of these films and get them transferred in HD quality instead of just like, I mean, what it looks like is this Jay just ripped it off an old VHS copy or something. I mean, I honestly wonder if that's what happened. Uh, even the, the documentary Graver made a Gary Graver movie, which doesn't actually appear to be a finished film, but, um, you know, is kind of the most enjoyable film in the box because I guess it's just clips and it is at least an insight into Graver's career. Um, that's very low quality too, and maybe that was just made on video in his garage as well. So it looks like you shot it on like a DV cam in the early two thousands, mm. and just in his garage, just and just kind of reminiscing. I mean, it's it's like like you said, it's probably the most interesting thing on this, just because it's it's one of the few times where you actually get some autobiographical details on his life, and it's not just 
the normal stuff you'd hear, but most of it's just kind of adjacent stuff. Not necessarily mm-hmm. any like huge production details, or he'll he'll, t- he'll tell like stories about working with Cameron Mitchell, which is amusing. But it's like it's Cameron Mitchell. <laughs> it's like. <laughs> Well, Cameron Mitchell's okay, and uh, <laughs> we like Cameron Mitchell, well, but yeah. We, we love Cameron Mitchell, but he's his most famous movie outside of Other Side of the Wind is like Deadly Prey. And... What did I see him in? I saw him in Buck and the Preacher recently, and he's pretty good as a bad guy in Buck and the Preacher, the Sidney Poitier movie, Western. Um, he, he's very good at playing a kind of sleazy guy, sleazy bad guy. Um, yeah, but I mean, I, Graver... You know, he's obviously a crucial person in the history of Orson Welles, and he really is a kind of saint, the way he essentially just became Orson's dog's body in a way. I mean, he he was a cinematographer, but he seemed to just drop everything to work with Welles, and, you know, if he got paid, it wasn't too frequently. Um, He seemed to basically just, when he established that uh, professional relationship with Welles, he really just was incredibly loyal to Wells and even long after Wells died he was incredibly loyal to Wells and trying to get the other side of the wind finished um so it's interesting to look at the work he was doing as a director both before and during and after the the, the period with Wells but I can't really say that I think too much of Wells directorial talent uh, rubbed off on on Graver because these are not Let's face it, they're not very good films. And... No, I mean, you, I remember the commentary track on the uh, on the Blu-ray. They basically said, like, you, you, if you know his career's weird when all of his best moments are in his porn movies, which is... <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah. I, I, I did watch both the, both the original ones that came on it, and the, 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 the Embracers, it, it kind of had, like, a charming clerk's quality to it, where it's just, like, some teenager kind of trying to make his first mm-hmm. film. So there's like I guess I could I can kind of respect it on that front. The second one, I mean, it's a softcore film. It's it is what it is. But I, I some of the cinematography was kind of interesting. Like it kind of, it almost had like a Lynchian vibe to it. Mm-hmm. Not necessarily in like storytelling strength, but just in like the weird oppressive atmosphere to it. But otherwise, there's not much there there in the film. A lot no, I mean. <laughs> You know, there are obviously films made on really low budgets, but there are lots of interesting films made on really, really low budgets <laughs> that show uh, show some artistry, you know, and or at least ideas. And, you know, there's nothing... I mean, looking at The, the Embracers and then this other film called... Uh, uh, and there was a little girl, is that what it's called? And she was, uh, I think it was like, and she was bad or something like that. I'm, and I'm then thinking. she was bad. There's a couple of titles for this weird 70s uh softcore film and then there's the but looking at the documentary wells made yeah sorry graver made uh, a Gra- gary graver movie which is i think a great idea for a documentary you know this guy who's worked in uh you know exploitation film and had all these kind of not necessarily satisfactory experiences but he's uh you know telling us okay this is this is how the producer cut this scene this is how i cut this scene i mean i think it's a great idea for a film but you could tell he was you know, a little bit uh, sore about all the producer cuts that he yeah. had his entire career. You know, I don't. I some, Graver strikes me. He always reminds me a little bit of Alicia Cook Jr. You know, the the actor who's in like The Big Sleep. Uh, you know, kind of. He looks a bit like him, and there's something about this sort of. I mean, I, I think Gat Graver was clearly a really nice guy. Everybody has always said that he was a super friendly, you know, caring guy. But maybe later in life, and and he started to make some more media appearances, sort of talking about the Wells legacy and doing this documentary and so on. He is a bit kind of like, you know, the aggrieved artist, uh, because not just in his own career, but in Wells' career as well. And he's very defensive of Wells and the legacy and and so on. But looking at his own career, I mean, he, he, he says, well, this is the way the producer did it which was stupid and then he says and this is the way i originally do it you're like yeah gary this is kind of stupid too you know um (laughs) i mean the the weirdest the movie um 
it, the vault of things it reminded me of it reminded me of a really interesting short film I saw at a film festival last year. At, there was a a socially distanced film festival like in the middle of nowhere, South Arkansas. I just mm-hmm. happened to go there because I had family down there. And they and the and these little filmmaking team that lived in town made this amazing documentary about a guy that had just recently passed away, and it turned out that he had correspondence from like every single major Hollywood star and reels of just about every major Hollywood film on like sixteen millimeter and original signed movie posters and like mm-hmm. all this amazing Hollywood memorabilia, and they just and no one knew about it until they died, and then they just kind of started digging through his house and they found all these like priceless treasures. I kind of have that same like feeling listening to Gary Graver talk where it's just like you see this guy who's had these all incredible like life experiences and gotten to work with major directors and apparently was a second unit director on uh, one of Steven mm-hmm. Spielberg's films. Yeah, uh, he worked in old ways, I think. Yeah. yeah, not one of Spielberg's best, but it's a Spielberg movie. So, but but you, you get the sense that this guy is just like he's he's seen he's, he's seen everything. He's worked in everything. He loves what he does. And it's just. It's it's sad that he's that there's not more to what is what he was capable of. I mean, even the even the producers on the blur I said it is like, I, I wish that there was a a Gary Graver masterpiece that way we could uh, uh-huh. sell this better. But they just had to kind of pick from his B movies, and that was all they had. I mean, it seems like even just going through the Internet Movie Database uh, listings of each of the films he directed, I'm not talking about the porn films, just the films he directed (laughs) under his own name, Uh, looking at the ratings of these films, like he seems to average about 3.5 out of 10 in the user ratings of his films. And, you know, he never really seemed to... I mean, he never seemed to work with anything like an adequate budget, but... Uh, you know, like to make any sort of like even kind of competently professional film. I mean, the films that I've seen that Gary directed are all kind of, they're very amateurish. And, but I do wonder if like somebody, there are other filmmakers working with that kind of limitation, sometimes Orson Welles, who could still bring off something impressive with very, very minimal resources. Um, I mean, my, my example is always, uh, I always go to Blue Ruin, which was made for like $40,000 or something like that. You can, mm-hmm. you can make a movie on with absolutely nothing. It's, you can make a very good one with absolutely nothing. So it's never just the lack of money that ruins a movie. It's just the people involved, really. Yeah, no, I like films that are made with very little money. I mean, I was, th- I was thinking about like Eric Romer, um, you know, and lo- I love looking at his films. I watched The Green Ray again uh, this week. And, you know, you can tell that's a film made with, like, four people behind the camera and two or three actors at any one time. Um, There's long stretches of dialogue, but it's never less than engaging. You know, and he knows how to write things. He knows how to put the camera in interesting places and, you know, and bring a bit of magic to, to something that is obviously made just almost like in an improvisational way. Um, but yeah, Grave is kind of trying to work in Hollywood, kind of trying to make Hollywood style movies, but you know, but I will say as a cinematographer and not talking about the films that he shot of his, for, that he also directed, uh, I think as a, as well as cinematographer, he did really great work. Um, I really love the way the other side of the wind looks and I love the way, uh, that, uh, if the, 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 the parts of Ephra fake, which Graver himself shot are great. And the, uh, I also think filming the trial, which is, sorry, no, filming Othello, which Graves shot, um, is also really, you know, considering it's shot with no resources. I mean, there's a camera, there's Graver clearly, and Wells. There's two people in the house making a movie. I think it looks really good. Um, so I think Graver certainly had some chops as a cinematographer. I don't know to what extent Wells gave him too much leeway creatively i mean i know i maybe graver was more of a talented technician and not a knowledgeable cinematographer and wells kind of called the shots creatively i think that's probably the case i'm tempted but to they, say, they do look good i'm tempted to say he has more he's very technically competent because if you watch yeah. some of the uh the big the medium budget films that he was not directing but just kind of shooting like those look fine like, I remember the footage mm-hmm. for uh, Ron Howard's movie, Grand Theft Auto. That movie looks fine. Right. It looks like American Graffiti. Like, 
that right. looks like a professionally made movie. Like, I'm, I'm sure if you gave him the budget and the ability to rent out professional cameras, he could deliver. But I'm sure for the rest of the time, he was just using yeah. his own gear and just doing and doing stuff competently to his own level. But as a director and a writer, he just doesn't he doesn't really have much life in him. I mean, uh, the the guys who did the commentary track on the embraces on this new Blu-ray, they they kind of talk about Graver as somebody who could work on you know with very fast and get a kind of decent result under very you know minimal circumstances. So he, if you had Graver as a cinematographer, he he could work fast. You'd get something that's acceptable, um, which they they kind of. The, the commentators acknowledge is maybe not the greatest reputation to have. I mean, it's a, a reputation that would maybe get you work in certain types of films with very, very low budgets. Um, but, you know, to be honest, I'd love to see some of these, you know, bad Gary Graver films taken from a 35 millimeter print uh, where we can actually see his work and judge it. Because I don't think you really can judge the embracers or any of the material on the Blu-ray judge the cinematography of these films based on those transfers. I mean, I've, you know, anyone who's into movies and into obscure things has probably sat through some really bad transfers of good films. I mean, I used to watch The Trial, the Wells film, you know, with a pretty bad VHS copy and, uh, you know, that wasn't really indicative of, of the, the quality of the cinematography. And when now I can look at a really great Blu-ray, which I think I know you also have, the, I tried the... to get it. I didn't. I didn't win the eBay auction. So, ah, okay. Try the German Blu-ray because I think it's the same transfer. But there is a really nice uh, transfer of the trial now, uh, where you can see how gorgeous the cinematography is, how bold it is, um, and it is like watching a completely different film because you know I'm used to seeing this murky VHS, <clears throat> which is you know kind of the only way to see it in the '90s. And now, I mean, in fact, I saw a 16 millimeter print of the trial once at a Cinematheque in Sydney, and you know, it was horrible. Um, and you just could barely even sit through the film. And now I see it in a, in a good transfer; it's just like a revelation. So I'm not saying that we're gonna, you know, look at the embracers in a pristine 4K uh, transfer and suddenly be astonished. Wow, we're seeing a masterpiece. But it would at least give us. An opportunity to assess the cinematography a bit better and uh although am i correct that graver isn't actually the credited cinematographer on the embraces he had somebody else credited for that i'd have to double check the credits list i it would not surprise me if he got someone else to do it because because he's acting in most of those scenes yeah. so unless he just i mean he's doing a lot of jokes yeah yeah so unless he's unless he's just turning the camera on and then running but running in front of it that's it's probably a bit ill-advised but I was going to say earlier in the conversation we were talking about Wells, but it's true of Graver, too. It's shocking how many of the movies that they've both done are just completely not available widescreen. Like, I know you talked about in your, le in your, in your uh, lessons about that a lot of the film, the, the material is still out there, and a lot of it's, like, currently sitting in the vaults at Munich right now. Like, there's a mm -hmm. version of, uh, uh, what was it? Merchant of Venice. Yeah, yeah. there's a version of Merchant of Venice just sitting in, uh, sitting in the vaults. There's... 35 millimeter prints of the trial out there but they haven't really gotten wide release at least not in, near me like you said there's a there's a like there's a region 2 blu-ray of uh, the trial i tried to get a copy of it but i couldn't but yeah it we'll get least... you one tyler don't worry we'll get you one <laughs> we'll work um, on it's it. not that hard I, I, you know i know a guy um <laughs> but uh, no 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 i mean it's widely available in europe uh that's the thing i mean if i've been you know i've been a big wells fan for well, since I was a teenager, so it's a long time, 20-something years. And, uh, you know, I've kind of seen the the process by which Wells films have emerged from obscurity. I mean, you've always been able to see a copy of Citizen Kane, of course, and Ambersons. Uh, I saw Touch of Evil in 98 when it came out in its reconstruction uh, at the cinema. That was the first time I ever saw Touch of Evil in 35 millimeter at the cinema in this restoration. And I kept coming back to see it again and again. Uh, but films like The Immortal Story, uh, even Ephra Fake too, I, I was lucky to be able to see it on TV in the 90s, Ephra Fake, but it was not a film that really anybody had heard of or seemed to be easy to find elsewhere. Um, 
so yeah, I mean, the immortal story was really hard to find. Uh, yeah, Othello had been reissued. I mean, the, the, there's always been this sort of variable availability, and that also is very dependent on where in the world you happen to be. I mean, things get released in you know in unusual places for a little bit of time, and then I think right now, however, it's a really great time to be an Orson Welles fan because. Not all, but mm, almost all. Certainly, all his major films are easily available uh, on Blu-ray. I think everything's on Blu-ray except for The Other Side of the Wind. Um, but obviously, you can see that pretty easily on on Netflix. So most of his work is pretty easy to find and to acquire um, in really good copies. You know, um, part of part of that is because of what Criterion has done uh, in the U.S. and to a lesser degree in the UK, but yeah, I mean, you can get Wells films in pretty decent uh, versions. There are the only exceptions are weird little obscurities like, like the work you mentioned uh, that's at the Munich Film Museum and has never been like commercially released. There was a they rediscovered uh, what was thought to be a lost uh, film called The Merchant of Venice. They the footage turned up. And it was presented in 2015 uh, at festivals. So it, there's a half-hour version of The Merchant of Venice by Orson Welles that exists, um, but there, it's never been commercially released. Is yeah. there a full cut of The Deep available? Like, in, uh, in... no, it's not available. I'm not sure. Well, there I mean, are... is there, it doesn't does it exist? I mean, I know it was never he never released it as commercially, but I didn't know if, it, if there was a version of it that he completed somewhat. I think. I think there's a couple of work prints at Munich, and so I think it would be possible to sort. I, I don't know if they've actually shown the whole work print at any point. Um, I think it's a mixture of black and white and color footage, so it's a very rough assembly type work print, uh, which is, I guess, in a way like what we what existed of the other side of the wind until you know 2018. But the deep. Uh, yeah, I mean, I guess it could theoretically be uh, made available in a, this really kind of rough form because I think the negative is gone. That's why they can't actually really do anything except show this rough work print. Um, you know, and there's parts of the movie are not dubbed. There's no audio. But I don't really mind seeing works in this state. I mean, I, I think I'd be happy to, you know, okay, if we have a scene where there's no audio, and, and there's a script, let's put subtitles on the screen. I mean, you know, that's the easy answer to that. And if you present the film, at, which is what Munich did, I mean, if there's all these presentation, um, all these films they presented at festivals, which were just fragments or assemblies of, you know, a series of fragments from a project, uh, they were presented as, look, this is not finished work. This was work in progress, but it's very interesting to look at it. Um, and, yeah, so I would love for there to be a nice box set, a Blu-ray of all that Munich material. This was all restored by Stefan Drossler, the head of the Munich Film Museum. I'd love for that to be available um, because I think, I mean, some of the materials turned up on YouTube and so on, but I think it would be, I mean, a great thing to have because it, it's so illuminating into this big chunk of Wells' career. I mean, a lot of, clips from that stuff turned up in the one man bad documentary so you can at least watch that and get an idea of them the projects um but yeah for the most part i think we're in a really good period for Orson Welles fans because so much of his work is available and more work keeps emerging uh and i don't think it's going to stop too soon yeah so i'd like to see an sorry go on. so yay or nay on buying um who would, would you recommend people buy the other side of gary, gary graver though <laughs> I wouldn't recommend they buy it. Uh, I'm I'm afraid to say because you know I mean the impulse it depends I guess why you want to buy it. If you want to buy it for filming the trial, I say just watch it on YouTube because that's the quality you're going to get on this Blu-ray. Um, I and I would love to, again I'd love to see the Munich Film Museum actually put out a transfer from the negative of that, but. Um, yeah, unfortunately, I can't really recommend uh, the Blu-ray. Although I do, uh, I do appreciate the enthusiasm which the uh, the producers of this Blu-ray put into it. Um, but I, I, I have never seen anything of Gary Graver's work that suggests that his, you know, 
a great underappreciated director of exploit, even of exploitation films. There's many, much better exploitation filmmakers out there doing much more interesting things. And you know, to be honest, a lot of the stuff that I see from Graver's career just kind of strikes me as quite puerile. You know. <laughs> I mean, you see these clips from, like, The Boys, for example, which, you know, was released as Texas Lightning is, I mean, Graver talks about this as if, you know, oh, I was making a serious film and then they made me turn it into a comedy. But, you know, it's just like, I couldn't really imagine this would work as a serious film in any way either. You know, it's just kind of a gross kind of movie. I don't know what you have you seen this uh, you, you you've got it on the dish you have to find the easter egg if you click yeah. on the poster I I have, I'll have to find it cuz I didn't see it when I was looking through it did, did you watch any of the uh interview stuff I looked at a little bit of it I haven't really had the time to go through it extensively and I mean that stuff's great I mean there's a few audio interviews I see um I love to see that material I guess from a historical point of view it's really great to have these kind of testimonials uh, about Graver and his work uh, because he is one way or another he is a fascinating figure. I you know to be honest the best thing would be if somebody else made a documentary about Graver. I really like the director who who made the did you see uh the film about the uh Osploitation films and uh, he did another film about the Canon uh Canon uh, films yeah, in the I 80s. Yeah, I did. I didn't uh, see the Canon movie. That was fun. He made Machete Maidens Unleashed, which is a film about uh, the Philippines <laughs> and the exploitation movies in the Philippines. Uh, I can't, the, the name of the director has escaped me, but I think somebody like that who just goes through all those, you know, hundreds of movies and picks the great shots or the great, you know, three second clips um, and puts it all together in a really fun and energetic way. That would be great, a great way to look at the career of Gary Graver because, you know, and I think they would also have to extend the consideration to these numerous porn films that he directed under another name which he didn't seem to uh, want to acknowledge. I mean, They'll Love Me When I'm Dead, the documentary about the other side of the wind has I think a few uh, you know, safe for work clips uh from some of uh, Graver's uh adult films. I was surprised they didn't put three that, that the one I I was reading about it the other day. I was surprised they didn't put 3 a.m. on that Blu-ray set. Like that felt like that would be yeah. one of the more historical ones you'd want to find on because Wells is credited in the movie. Yeah, that well, I mean, they gave him an editing credit apparently. I don't think he's credited. I, I definitely think he would not have wanted to be credited. <laughs> the story is there is this story and i'm not a hundred percent convinced that it's true but it's a good story that uh you know wells needed graver to work for him and graver was busy editing this porn film that he'd made called 3 a.m and so wells agreed to step in and edit some of the movie if graver would to free up graver somehow um and they, they in the in they'll love me when i'm dead they they kind of they show a clip and so on. I'm not entirely convinced. I mean, it may be true. Who knows? But I've never seen any. <laughs> See, the thing is, I spend so much time in the archives looking at letters, and I've seen lots of letters, private letters between Wells and Graver, and and Graver to, to to other people as well. And you know, I never saw anything to suggest that. But I mean, it's entirely possible, of course. But the letters between Wells and Graver in the archives in Michigan and so on are um, really fascinating because they had. You know, I mean, grave. The, this, the, the public perception of their relationship is, you know, Wells is this domineering kind of like genius, and uh, Graver is like the willing dog's body who's just going to do whatever Orson says. And Graver basically, you know, abandons his life at the first call of Wells. But the letters suggest that things were more complicated than that, and there are lots of financial. Uh, letters about money and letters about Graver desperately needing to make money and Wells saying I have no money either and and you know there, there are a lot of letters from Wells basically not I wouldn't say cussing Graver out but they they seem kind of like you know Wells trying to reason with Graver and you know I don't know they ha I, I have to go through it all to try to figure out exactly how, what projects they're talking about but 
I think they had a really complicated working relationship and personal relationship, but there clearly was a lot of love there too. Wow. That's so, there's probably a whole book in there by itself, just their relationship. Good grief. Yeah. I mean, Graver wrote a book. I don't know if you've seen Graver's no, book. No, I haven't. But he, he wrote a, a memoir of working with Wells. He also made another, this is another thing I was a bit surprised wasn't on this box set. Well, it's not a box set, it's a single disc. But because uh, Graver made a documentary in the 90s called Working with Orson Wells. Um, I don't know if you've seen it. It's up online on YouTube. Again, it's a kind of amateurishly made documentary. There's lots of Cameron Mitchell, who turns up as a talking head. <laughs> but uh, that at least has a sort of historical value, maybe, that would have really been good to include in this box set. It's just really Graver, another cheap documentary of Graver talking to the camera and explaining, although it was made in the earlier 90s, actually. So he's quite a bit younger um, and he's just really explaining to the camera, you know, how he came to work with Wells. So it's sort of like a documentary version of what basically became his book. Um, but his book is, I mean, it's not a particularly well-written book, but it's a really valuable historical document to have, uh, you know, because it's all about that relationship. And, you know, there's things in there that you, you learn about Wells' career in a period where there's still so many question marks. I mean, what's fascinating, for example, okay, there is this Jim Thompson novel uh, called A Hell of a Woman. Um, you know, what? Jim Thompson was, you know, the author of The Killer Inside Me, a really, you know, great kind of noir writer. And uh, Graver and Wells both became interested in doing a film of A Hell of a Woman. And I think there's a script. I, I don't know whether it was Graver's project or if it was a kind of joint project, but uh, the film wound up being made, uh, the, the book was made into a film in France uh, by Alain Corneau, actually into a really good film called Cyrie Noir, um, which I really recommend in the late 70s. So if somebody took that book and made it into a great film. Um, but again, it's like, okay, so... Wells is getting interested in doing another kind of noir story in the late seventies. And I'm not sure whether it was like kind of helping Graver out or whether Wells is becoming interested, but yeah, there's so many question marks about uh, Wells career in the seventies. Uh, I've tried to sort of answer some of them, but uh, yeah. So I do recommend Graver's book if you can get a copy. All right. I got to wrap up on this then because I got other stuff I got to do that immediately after this, but uh, where can people uh, find you if they want to, if they're interested in your classes going forward? Yeah, sure. Um, well, I've got a website, so it's matthewasbergear.com. Uh, I'm on Twitter. You can send me a message there or send me a message at uh, matthewasbergear at gmail.com. And uh, yeah, I mean, I'm planning to repeat New Hollywood uh, in the summer. So it's a 12-week online course about 70s Hollywood, and I'm going to be repeating the Orson Welles course again sometime soon. I'm not quite sure when. We'll see what kind of interest I get. But I mean, it's such fun. So as you know, we have a great time. So uh, I really just enjoy having a great excuse to watch all those movies again and again and again. So <laughs> well, I have my thorough recommendation. So it was good, good, good to talk to you. It's been a while. Yeah, good to talk to you too, Tyler. So we'll uh, catch up soon. Thanks sure. very much. Have a good day. You too. Take care. The Antisocial Network is a Group Think Productions podcast. Editing, producing, and hosting are by Tyler Hummel. Artwork by Crystal Cowley, and original music was composed by Melissa Lafira and the late Dan Smola. Like, subscribe, and please let us know what you think about the show in the comments below if you'd like to see anyone interesting be a guest on the show. Thank you for listening.